Um, coaching, probably been coaching now for probably 15, 16 years. Um, coaching journey, it happened more by accident than, than anything else. So I'd always been in elite sports since probably about 10 years of age, or nine years of age. Um, and then all of a sudden, it would just happen by chance one day that somebody said, oh, you know, the, the coach is not able to take a session or not able to do something with it. Um, and, and I just picked up the reins from there, really. So that was in, in terms of coaching, but I had a sports science background before then. So as I say, sport, I've probably not been out of sport since I was nine years of age. So I, I, was I going to transition from a player into a, a coach? I didn't know. It just, it just all well, happened by a little judgment. And what I'd done through sports science is looked at um, a, a multidisciplinary approach. Was I going to be a sports scientist, an exercise physiologist, a, a, um, something to do with medicine and physio? I, I didn't know. But all of a sudden, then the, the, the coaching element just had more by accident design. And from that point onwards, I've not got back really. Uh, again, when I, when I first started coaching, the first thing that uh, I picked up on was football. But as part of um, sports science qualifications, we, we did rounded sports. So we did level one athletics coach, basketball coach, um, trampolining. So I'd got a real sort of diverse range of coaching disciplines, if you like, when I first, very first started coaching. And then um, as, as I became more au fait with football, football has been my primary sport, and as I became more au fait with football and, and the coaching pathway and qualifications, um, I progressed through doing you know, all the, the coaching licences up to, um, to UEFA. Um, and then I, I coached in, I started out coaching in what you would probably consider sort of HE, FE type environments. Um, then moved into uh, a professional environment, so I moved into academy football. Then back into sort of HE, FE type stuff with academy football almost as a subsidiary. And then, um, and then moved into almost coach education, coach development, uh, whilst keeping my hand in coaching. But then that opened up a whole new avenue for me because then I was suddenly researching coaching and then looking at what was sort of best practice. And then it almost took on the guise of a complete experimental phase. So my coaching wasn't consistent in terms of I was with a specific group. It happened more that I was experimenting with groups and with individuals and, and all sorts of things. Um, and that, that was probably over a, 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 a six year period. And then when I started to more implement that, that experimented work, that then I started to realise some of the, the, the fruits of that almost research, if you like, um, and then ended up uh, over the last 18 months working with an international group. As, as a, a very embryonic and, and very new coach, it was very didactic, dictatorial, you know, you, you became the position of authority, it was, you know, the coach was almost perceived as the role of a teacher in its loosest sense, you know, you were the, the, the figure, the one that had to educate. I think now my, my philosophy is very much a, a, a balanced view around, sometimes it's about giving uh, individuals things that they need to support them, sometimes it's about giving them problems to solve, sometimes it's about giving them their own empowered solutions to whatever the, the puzzle may be. So I, I, I have a very balanced view of coaching now, that it's, it's about giving players um, support and what they need, when they need it, how they need it, as opposed to, you know, I'm the crutch that they have to always look towards for solutions and problems and um, it's very much about, as, as time goes on, um, somebody once told me that um, a good coach has made themselves redundant and they're absolutely spot on. The more they can be devoid of me and, and problem solved, the better they're going to be in terms of their competitive environment. A number of things really, I think you, you I, I would argue it from a top up, bottom down approach, so for example there's been people that you know, you've looked to as, as mentors, um, where you've seen their work and you've seen the, the um, impact of their work, but also from the, the point of view of, of players as well, where they, they've made me think because I've seen um, the impact positively and negatively, where I've gone, crack yet, if I hadn't have done that, that might not have done that. So I think it's, it's been a, almost a 360 degree process whereby it's, it's been some support from, from others that are, are more expert, if you like, but also from those that 
aren't feeling being involved in the event that they've gone yeah I'm not sure about that or can you give me more of that or so I think it's uh, as, as I've moved through the years whether I've known it by accident or design I think if I reflect back it's probably been more of a 360 degree process. I think I think in it in my very very early days um, there was a, a, a gentleman called Andy Beasley at, um, at the club that I work for and, and he he was a real um, technician tactician and, and he shaped the way that I thought about um, the game you know to be to be a good learner be a good student of the game and understand and know your subject matter before you start interfering with players learning so he, he influenced me very much on on that that front. Um, I think as I've moved through the years it's probably been um, mid that probably a, a guy called um, Paul Holder who's at, um, who's at Brighton now. Um, he, he was a real thinker of how to get players to do things that operate within the context and the domain of, of uh, the game. So I think he shaped then, so I've gone from understanding my subject matter to then understanding the process of accelerating players' learning based on the time that you have available and how do you assess that learning and how do you develop, um, how do you develop the players um, as a programme. And then the, the, the last one, and, and these are all sort of direct influences, the last one is probably um, a guy called Dan Machichi, um, who is um, highly random, uh, man is a box of frogs. But he, he really made me think about dealing with the players as individuals. Um, you know, people talk about it's a team sport, yes it is, but it's about how you develop and deal with the individual um, based on what attributes that they have, you want them to remain with and then bolt things into their attributes to play the game, not giving them the game and, and di you know, making them digest. They've got to do this because of this. So it's about taking the players and, and, and why we've recruited them in the very first place and building into them, not changing them into something that they're not, which and I've seen a, a dynasty of that over the last sort of three decades. Um, indirectly, I would I would probably argue that um, it's more of a cultural thing than anything else. I spend a lot of time going around the world in Europe, particularly looking at, at what what are the you know sort of world leading world class practice. Um, and I would argue that whilst it's it's been direct because I've seen it firsthand indirectly in terms of the individuals that put it together but I don't know I would argue that probably the culture and and philosophy the actual coaching and player philosophy at, at um, FC Barcelona has been without a shadow of a doubt one of the greatest influences that's over the last five years has made me really think about why I'm doing what I'm doing how I do it is it to the advantage of the players how do you know players are developing growing within a brand that really really made me um, stop and think I think the one one they embrace their culture. So we have to understand that within any any given environment and domain, what what is what are you operating within? So you look at things like the all black culture. It suits them, but probably wouldn't suit anybody else around the world. Um, Barcelona are the same. They embrace their their um, their whole social being and culture. And then what they do is they they look at them what brand they want from their football that links to their culture. So it's very about aesthetical, beautiful, patient type. Um, and culture, you know, look at their artists, Gaudi, Picasso, um, Salvador Dali, you know, they have a real thirst for beauty, but if you look at Gaudi's work, it's been going on for centuries, and it's still not finished. So, um, you, you look at that, and then that started to, to, to make me think about what our culture is, and what, what's our background, you know, most of ours is military stuff, national service, regimented, um, war type, island mentality, we'll fight them on the beaches, you know, that's who we are. So can we change that? Probably not. So what we have to do is use that in the best way possible. It's almost like going to Brazil and saying, put the flags away, put the, the um, bright colours away. You know, you'd probably be removed out of Brazil very quickly. So we can't change who we are, but we can use it. So there was that, and then looking at how that manifested itself in terms of their coaching. So they're very, um, they, have, they want certain things from their players in terms of their brand, but they're patient with the players, they're prepared to wait for the players, and that, that um, that, that, is, that links is indicative of their society um, and it's took them a good part of 40 years to, to building their brand um, you know, it started with Renus Michaels in the 70s and then Cruyff and then you know, Ricard Guardiola you know, it's been a dynasty of evolution to getting them where they are at today 
uh, with one of the most effective player development systems in the world. So I think that the lesson of it takes time to do it is important, um, and also waiting on players. You know, they, they won't release players until they're 20, mid 20s. So waiting on players is absolutely is crucial, um, because you know, none of us have got a crystal ball and, and predict the future. So we have to to you know, be cautious about how we deal with with the players. Um, and then the, the final piece of the jigsaw is is how they dealt with individuals within there. You know, even the under nine right the way through to uh, Lionel Messi in the first team. They all have an individualised program. It's not just a physical thing. It's a football thing. It's a tactical thing. It's a technical. It's a social thing. And they individualise their their players' work right the way through the system. And um, that really made me think about how we can implement some of that into our culture, society, DNA, whatever we already call it. Um, I would say having a, a brand that is transparent, that players know and understand what we're aiming towards. So having an outcome, having an objective is, is important. Um, and that the players understand how and why that works as well. Um, it's not just to say, right, we're playing that way, but why are we playing that way? What's that going to do for an opponent um, is the first thing. The second thing is about the individual work. That is, that is what I've seen more accelerated learning over the last um, 12 months as a result of dealing with them as individuals within a group than anything else. Um, and the final one is how you use that in your coaching. So, you know, I use a, a huge amount of constraints I'd learning um, with the players so that it gives them puzzles and problems to solve. Um, and then when they can't and they're struggling to solve it, give them ideas, clues, triggers to help them become more coach devoid. So, for example, if we were playing a, um, an opponent like Germany, we would set up technically, tactically within, um, say, a, um, a, an attacking session, how we're going to play against Germany. Um, and they will have team objectives, unit objectives that is designed to play against them. Then what we would have is individual programs that operate within that. So if, for example, we've got a, um, a number four and she has a really good range of passing, then part of our tactics might be that we play to the 7-11 positions wide, utilising her range of passing. So she gets to work on the things she's good at. Now, what? So I'm thinking of a specific example of a number four. What she struggled with is being able to receive to play forwards. So constraining her as a um, as a restriction constraint by saying to her she can't receive the ball unless she's facing forwards. So she has to solve the problem. Now, whilst it's you would argue it's a command style, it's not it's trial and error as well. So I'm giving her a specific problem that's command, but she's having to problem solve it in the context of the situational dynamics of the game, the random, the randomness, to be able to solve the problem of having to play, you know, forwards every time she receives the ball. So now within the tactical um, development that we've got, trying to play and set up for an opponent, she can work on a thing she's good at because we would utilise her skills based on you know, playing an opponent, and she works on the things that she needs to develop on all in the same session. Um, and we would have that for all 22 if it was an 11 v 11 and they would work on that, with, they would reflect on that post the session as to how well they're done as individuals based on video analysis and um, their own feel within the game. Uh, and I might not allude to all their programmes within one session, but I might be dealing with five or six, seven, eight individuals at any one moment in time. I, I, I don't know that. Um, because I don't know what they'll do. So if, for example, the number four, she would know that programme, now there might be an instance that um, she receives and plays backwards and I cluck it, but I would, because I know the players inside and out, I would recognise that and know that instantly. And it takes, that's where the time thing comes in, to knowing 22, 33 players, individual programmes, as trying to put a technical, tactical session on and sorting their programmes out is, a, is quite a high, high level of, of skill. Um, but over time it actually becomes almost second nature because you know the players and you know what, what they're working on at any one moment in time. Variety really, um, so we have a lot of one-to-ones um, or groups, you might be units, it might be individuals um, and what I get them to reflect on is first and foremost what they're good at, so what strengths do they have and sometimes they don't know that and they, they have hidden talents that they're not they didn't recognise that they had previously. So we'll put on sometimes generic sessions, so we'll do a running with the ball activity, um, and all of a sudden you, you unearth this talent that they go, oh, I didn't realise I could do that. So you, then you encourage and want more of that. So we'll uncover hidden talent sometimes with the players. And then um, other things that we'll do is, is get them to reflect on their work post-game, and um, 
we don't give them too many targets. So what we tend to work on the ratio is of three things that they're good at that they keep and one thing that they build into their game and periodically then it's reviewed. So it could be a six week period, it could be a four week, it could be a three week period, just depending on what contact time we have with them. Then what happens is when they go off camp, off the, on, on the road, we have an electronic system called the PMA, which is a um, performance management application. And what happens is, is the players have that program online and they actually report against that on a weekly basis. So they have a program, an international program, but it's not, it's just football, let's be honest about it, whether they're playing domestically or internationally, it's just football. Um, so they go away to the clubs and then they work on that in their domestic games and reflect on that every week. So I should be able to go on to the PMA today, look at what who they played last week, they'd be able to tell me two things, um, what went well within the three and the one, and what they're going to work harder on in next week's training and games. So just two very simple statements that they complete every week and very quickly I get a, a picture built of you know 30 odd players, what they're doing weekly, how the football program's working for them, what they're working hard on, how they're, what, are they struggling with anything. If I sense anything or you know they have an open forum where they can ask questions, um, my program says this, I'm struggling to do that, have you got any help, you know, have you got any solutions that might help me with that? So it's quite an open dialogue and almost a, a, a weekly, sometimes even daily contact with the players. Never fear making mistakes. Um, in my early coaching, I wanted everything to be perfect, everything to be lines that look straight, everything to be um, in neat boxes, um, everything had to be planned for. And if it goes off plan, it was it was, a, it was your worst nightmare. I think as, as you go through, and I suppose it's a maturity thing in terms of your experience, um, never fear when things go wrong or fail, because from that it's probably been the most learning that I've ever got. You know, the, the sessions that go well, I go, oh, it was nice, well, it was great, thanks, bang that. But the ones that don't, I then have to problem solve to find out why they didn't, what was it, how did it work, you know, is it something I did, was it the player, well, you know. So I think the, the ones where they've been not so good have been the most powerful things. And to worry less about when it goes wrong or off piste. Um, and it's not to say that it, you know, it going wrong is right, because it's not, because it's the player's time and we, we have to accelerate that. But from that comes the fact you're more likely to get it right in the future with future groups, future players or even future sessions. So that is definitely, don't worry about chaos and randomness and failure. Um, the, the, the medals I wear are the players, there's no debate on that. Uh, if I look at last year's group, the 98 Bournes, we had, um, of that group, 11 made um, Super League debuts at, at 16 years of age, which is quite remarkable. That's almost like 11, um, 11 internationals from our, our England 16s boys programme making Premier League debuts. That is quite remarkable. Um, and they, they tell us, they say that you know, the international programme, by being dealt with as an individual, accelerated their, their, their whole four corner, you know, physical decision making, psychological, um, emotional, uh, tactical, technical understanding of where they were at, what they needed to do, how they were developing. Um, and they're convinced that that stuff help them uh, and what I see now is they're continuing with that even though the clubs might not buy into it as individuals they do that they take it they take it and work with it themselves it's still that group have, have moved on now into the next age group but they still message me at times and I have to almost deflect it onto the other coach and say look you know, they're asking this what do you think um, but, but yeah they're, they're without a shadow of a doubt they're the ones that make me smile when you see them achieve and, and move forwards and you know just all of a sudden when they do something in a game and you know they've been working hard on it for as long as they have. Um, they're, the, they're the things that, that are the most rewarding. The results, they, they mean very little to me, I have to be quite honest. They're indicative of where the, the players and the group's developing, but the, the players growing and, and moving forwards, um, when, it, when sometimes they stumble and sometimes it's smooth, they're the bits.